Hello and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And I'm here to welcome you to a series of conversion stories taped in Scandinavia, where many are born automatically into the Lutheran State Church. We're joined first by Ola Trerholm, well-known Lutheran professor, formerly at the Norwegian School of Mission and Theology, whose conversion raised attention in ecumenical circles far beyond the borders of Norway. Professor, welcome to The Journey Home. It's great to meet you and great to have you on the program. And uh, we're here to talk about your journey of faith, uh, both in uh, coming to the fullness of truth in Jesus Christ, which was a long journey. It always is for all all of us, but also home to the Catholic Church. So welcome to The Journey Home program. Uh, What we normally do in the program is invite the guest to take a long step back and uh, give us a little glimpse of your early spiritual journey, long before you ever thought about the Catholic Church, if you would, Ola. Well, you know, I <clears throat> I grew up within the framework of a typically Norwegian Lutheran, fairly low church piety. That mm. was my background with my family and my parents. And that was actually, I mean, the, the framework of my spiritual life uh, in, well into my, my years as a theological student. Mm. But while I was a student at the Norwegian Lutheran School of Theology in Oslo, I, I, uh, there was a certain development, and I, 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 I got involved sort of in the uh, Lutheran High Church movement, which was at that time fairly strong among students. Uh, Maybe let our audience understand, High Church Lutheran in Norway, would it be almost Catholic, a very kind of a, maybe not a... a, a a decisive decision to become more Catholic, but really appreciate your Lutheranism and the history of Lutheranism. Is that what that means? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I mean, in in formal terms, it was very kind of Catholic in its appearance. I mean, with with, uh, regard to liturgy and these things and also theological attitudes. But of course, I mean, uh, it wasn't in any sense uh, in in, in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. So there was a difference in that respect. But uh, I mean, in regard to its outward appearance and its form. It it was a form of Catholicity. And I should maybe also say that I I think I had a Catholic faith long, long, long before I was received into the full fellowship of the the Roman Catholic Church. How did you get that, do you think? Was it part of your, your childhood upbringing? Of course, there was a certain break from this very low church uh, background. That was, I mean, my parents were involved in the missionary movement, and that was very low church and not very Catholic, not at all. Uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> even a bit on the anti-Catholic side, one might might suggest. But then coming to Oslo and, and meeting this high church movement, that was different. And that was probably also the first, the very early, but the first step towards becoming a Roman Catholic. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, for a long time I thought I could live out a certain form of Catholicity within the Lutheran Church. Um, I had this idea, and I still have it actually, that uh, the Lutheran Reformation didn't set out to form a separate church, but the Lutheran Reformation saw itself as a renewal movement within the one church. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was quite appropriate, actually, to try to live out some sort of Catholic faith within that framework. But I have to say also that that became, in my opinion at least, and in my experience, it became increasingly difficult uh, because there were uh, reforms in the life of the church, uh, reforms in regard to liturgy that made it difficult. Uh, There were also things in regard to sacramental practice that made this difficult Mm. so uh, but I I started out as a kind of uh, evangelical Catholic you might say (laughs) and that is a concept that I think is very kind of appropriate and says quite a lot about the original intention of the Lutheran reformers Mm. as I said they didn't they didn't want to form a separate church that came more as a result of 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 the 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 direction things took actually But that wasn't the the original intention, in my opinion. I mean, to a certain extent, uh, the reformers, today we're so accustomed to a new church starting every other day, a different thing. If you don't like it, go start your own. I mean, that wasn't a part of their world in the 1500s. No, definitely. And I think you see it very clearly also in the confessional writings of the, the Lutheran Reformation. 
uh, I mean, in the Augsburg Confession, which is the main confessional writing, it said very clearly that there is nothing in this uh, this confession that would deviate from not only the Catholic Church but also the Roman Church. So they were kind of of concerned to keep up their ties to the Church. Uh, and saw themselves basically as a renewal movement mm. within the church. Now, in your low church Lutheran upbringing, I'm, I'm trying to compare it to America, mm. for example, mm. uh, would it be like the evangelicals in America? Or I've often met lifelong Lutherans that talk about their upbringing as very nominal. Mm. What, what would you, how would you describe your upbringing? <laughs> No, I wouldn't say it was nominal. Of course, the, <clears throat> that is very often the case in Norway okay. with this huge Lutheran state church, and yeah. you have lots of people that belong to the church but doesn't kind of live in the church. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't the case with me, not at all. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I mean, my, my parents were involved in something called Missionssamband. That's a missionary organization mm-hmm. within the church of Norway, and it's it's very low church, and it was some... Kind of inspired by 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 um, English uh, evangelicals in a yes, sense, okay. yes. But uh, I think you have these things also in the U.S. Actually, I, I seem to remember there was something called the Wisconsin Synod of the Lutheran Church. Yes, very conservative. Yes, Lutheran very Lutheran conservative. Yes. That would would be comparable to it. And one of the big heroes is Hans Nielsen Hauge. Hmm. And I remember I came once to a college up somewhere. In, in, I think it was in Moorhead, in, 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 in uh, is that one of the, the, the Dakota states? I, I can't quite remember. Moorhead, um, is it South or North Dakota? Maybe it's, yeah, okay. yeah, it's yeah. somewhere. And they had a huge statue of Hans Nielsen Hauge uh, <laughs> uh, on, on campus, actually. So I think you would find things that would be similar to that also in the U.S. Uh, and, and, and these would very often have their background in Norway and came over to the States from So really Norway. you were brought up as many very committed Lutheran families yeah. with a deep commitment to Jesus Christ yes. and living out the faith. Yes. So it wasn't a nominal upbringing yeah. at all. It was a, a, a deeply religious... Oh, definitely, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was surely the case in, in our home, both my, my parents. My mother is still alive, and, and that was very important in our home. And, and we uh, were, were reading scripture together every morning, and we were using the Norwegian, the old Norwegian hymnal, and all these things. So that's what I grew up with. And um, <clears throat> um, so that that wasn't nominal at all. It was almost oh, the opposite. Okay. But I mean, of course, as a young kid, these things didn't appeal that much. <laughs> So I thought I, I was blessed with very, very sensitive and, and, and reasonable parents. So they allowed me to, to, to visit the YMCA <laughs> for a while. <clears throat> so I also had some involvement in the, in the YMCA movement uh, before I left Stavanger and became a student. Now, when you went into student, uh, did you dis- were you discerning a call to ministry? or I mean, you definitely ended up in theology. Well, you know, when I started my theological studies, the dream and the, 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 the goal, so to speak, was to end up as a missionary in, in at that time, Tanzania uh-huh. in, in Africa, because we had friends or families that were serving as missionaries in, in, uh, in Tanzania. So that was my my big ambition to to become a missionary for this low church uh, missionary organization mm-hmm. that I mentioned. But then things took a different uh, development, and I, I, I uh, fairly soon I, I uh, became involved in theology as a, as a scholarly discipline, and that was very intriguing and interesting and challenging, and that's what I ended up with. And opened your heart also to, uh, to the to the higher church, the, it, the it, liturgy and the history, it and the... definitely did. <clears throat> and these things were sort of two sides of the same coin in a sense. They were parallel events. Well, understanding the Lutheran background as a renewal movement within the wider Catholic Church mm. still forces you to deal with there were differences. Definitely. In the, did you, when did you start dealing with those issues? Well, that became, of course, very obvious to me when I, 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 I it became increasingly clear f- to me that there was, a, there was a discrepancy between the original Reformation and the path Lutheranism had taken. Mm. And in my opinion, the big turning point was actually in the 19th century, 
you know, 19th century Lutheranism, particularly on the European continent, was very strongly involved, marked by, by two currents, and partly neo-pietism mm-hmm. and partly liberalism. Mm-hmm. And people tend to see these two currents as opposing and different, very different. Mm-hmm. But I thought, to me, it became clear in the sense that they were actually also there were strong similarities between these two movements and that was mainly due to the fact that both of them were primarily concerned with faith as a very kind of personal inward thing I mean a very inward and they that that had enormous impact on their understanding of the role of the church and the place of the church. Mm. I think both among liberals and um, pietists, mm. you would see them, you would find that, well, some might grant the church some kind of practical role as a kind of practical framework of personal, authentic faith, mm. whilst others would see the church as clearly counterproductive to personal, mm. authentic faith. So the church didn't actually have a, a place in that connection. So that was one thing that became increasingly clear th- to me. And I have actually been using this sort of awkward expression, liberal pietism, <laughs> seeing these two as, as, uh, as uh, not identical, not in any sense. But uh, when you approach liberalism and pietism in the perspective of ecclesiology, of the doctrine of the church, you would see there would be clear uh, similarities. I know that my own journey of faith uh, brought up Lutheran and then later as a Presbyterian pastor. I mean, oh, a, right. a long yeah. backstory. But okay. for me, one of the biggest differences was the, the problem of the, the Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura. Yes. I wonder if that for yourself was a, uh, an well, issue. Well, it was, study. but I, I, I always thought maybe that this doctrine has developed in a slightly different uh, direction than it was originally meant. You know, mm. <clears throat> I, sh- I shan't be t- too theological about it, but you know, sola scriptura, that th- doesn't mean scripture alone, it means by scripture alone. <laughs> and the point is simply that scripture should be kind of the governing principle but not in any sense to exclude it, the, the, the tradition of the church, mm. but more as the kind of the core of the tradition of the church. Mm. But this developed in a, in a different direction, and then you had this impression that there was scripture and nothing else. Mm. But I, sh- I don't believe that is particularly Lutheran. That was yeah. not what the, refo- the, 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 the reformers meant. And I particularly think Luther in the sense that when he's holding up scripture alone and defending that, he's still speaking from himself in a very deep Catholic upbringing and Catholic assumption of his of own faith. I mean, I think with Luther, you would see, particularly in his practice, of course, I mean, it was a difficult situation. And right. They got annoyed with each other and they got angry and you, you know how <laughs> these things can, can be. But, I mean, in his personal piety, he remained deeply committed to the Catholic tradition, in my opinion. And not least in regard to the Eucharist and the Eucharistic celebration, there is a story about a Lutheran pastor um, that he was serving in in Eisleben, in in Luther's uh, town. And um, he was celebrating his first Mass. And uh, he, he, uh, he, he, um, at that time, they had the exact number of oblates, you know. And he lost one oblate in early in the mass, in the celebration. And I think this guy, he didn't know what to do, so he took uh, an unconsecrated oblate and placed it together with the consecrated ones and handed out that. And, you know, after the mass, he went down on his knees and he found this oblate that it had lost. And once more, not knowing what to do, he put it back together with the unconsecrated ones. And when Luther heard about this, this guy was excommunicated immediately for doing something that would violate the celebration of the Eucharist. So I think in terms of the Eucharist especially, Luther remained deeply committed to his Catholic roots. There's also uh, stories about uh, his continued devotion to Mary. Yes, I think so also. I mean, uh, of course, there was some disagreement in regard to the role of Mary and the saints in the life of the church and in life of... of, of I think Luther saw Mary more as, as, as a, a model, a role model. Mm. Uh, but, but surely, I mean, he was deeply, deeply committed to, 
to marry. There's yeah. no doubt about that. But these things have changed, you know. And as we said, the, the next generation theologians of Lutherans took yes. it a whole yes. stronger direction. Yes, and I think maybe the next partly, but mainly, I think, in my opinion, the 19th century is the disaster, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> I don't like that much. Also in cultural terms, I think it was, was difficult, but it, it meant uh, an enormous lot to the Lutheran tradition, and it changed very mm. radically. And of course, that was also the, the, uh, the foundation of Norwegian Lutheranism. And you know, later? Yes, ah, yes. Okay. Well, also, when I grew up, actually, that was very much uh, mm. kind of a neo pietist version of Lutheranism. But your lower church Lutheranism was in many ways that a, a kind of a renewal movement within the wider Lutheranism in Norway? Would you see that uh, missionary movements and all of that? Or? To a certain extent it was, but then <clears throat> one has to admit that there was a certain sectarian uh, mm. attitude to it as well, because I mean these people were, were very critical on on the development uh, not only of society but also of the church. So there was a certain reclusiveness to this, and also uh, almost sectarian. Mm. So I, I, I they. They saw themselves as a renewal movement in one sense, but they didn't contribute much to renewal, and they didn't have much influence at the development of the Norwegian Lutheran Church, and I, I think I have to say. Well, it's a struggle in Norway, right? I mean, the, the whole culture as a, as a whole, though a state church... Mm struggles with its Lutheranism, is it, would you It does actually, and <clears throat> I think one, one needs to remember there is one feature that is rather special to Norway. I, I understand you come from Sweden now, and then uh, the critical movements within the Swedish church, they've formed their own churches. They formed this very big and uh, mm. important Swedish mission covenant church. Mm. But in Norway, I mean, the critical ones, they, they remained within the church, sort of. Mm. They stayed within the church. <clears throat> and then, of course, there were struggles all the time between these people and also the leadership of the church. And that has been a concern in, in mm -hmm. Norwegian Lutheranism for, for, for decades, uh, many, uh, well, for, for hundreds of years, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think today it's fair to say that things have changed. Uh, they don't play that much of a role anymore. And these uh, organizations, they were very influential at one stage, but Today, they don't have much influence, I think it's fair to say. So in your own journey, as you're teaching theology mm. as a Lutheran at a Lutheran school, mm. right? Definitely. Uh, for you, the issue was recognizing. What, what was the main kind of uh, push for you to make the jump into the Catholic faith? Well, first, I, I need to say, of course, <clears throat> which all of those who have Done, done this would know that it's it's a long process yeah. and it's a winded winding road and it's <laughs> difficult and, and and there isn't actually any ideal solutions one has to, has to say but with me I think the the, 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 the really crucial factor was growing and a fairly strong longing to live a full sacramental life mm. and that wasn't that easy within the Lutheran Norwegian setting. And also, I have lived abroad. I, I, I lived in Strasbourg for four years, mm. and I was a member then, of course, of the, the Lutheran Church in Alsace. Mm. And it was a very kind of impressive church in many respects, but they hardly... I mean, there would be Eucharists maybe once a month at the most. Mm. Uh, when they had the Eucharist, uh, I think the priest, the, the pastor, was a bit concerned, a bit worried almost to visualize the so-called real presence. Uh, I mean, this is common doctrine with Lutherans and Catholics. Uh, we, 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 both Catholics and Lutherans, believe in the real presence. But my opinion, my feeling has been that this is not becoming sufficiently uh, visible Mm. in the Lutheran celebration of the, of the Eucharist. And that became difficult to me. I mean, uh, I was a little, you get a little bit tired almost of, of having oblates that are not being consecrated. I mean, uh, when they run out of stuff, they simply go out and pick up some more and, and they don't even read one single word of it. So it's, it can't be seen as consecrated. That, that was quite widespread in these days. I think it's 
better today, but uh, <laughs> to me that was actually quite quite crucial. Mm. And this yearning, this longing to live a full sacramental life was mm. very important. And that's what I feel that I, that was the... I can do now as a, as a Roman Catholic, and I'm very grateful for that. Now that, it, that had its impacts on your career, is that right? Well, it didn't have uh, all these impacts where were sort of uh, expected <clears throat> because, uh, I mean, uh, it was very clear to me and also to my colleagues that uh, when I became Roman Catholic, I, my che- I had a chair in dogmatics. <laughs> and that is quite something in Lutheranism, you know. It's only a tiny little step below the Holy Trinity almost. <laughs> it's, it's really serious to be a, a professor of dogmatics in Lutheran. Uh, so I was prepared, and that was also my opinion, that when I became Roman Catholic, I couldn't continue to teach Lutheran dogmatics. <laughs> I could, of course, but I shouldn't. That would be difficult. And I, I think also most... Catholic institutions wouldn't allow a Lutheran to teach yeah. doctrine or dogmatics. Right. So that was expected, but of course it was a bit difficult. And then we tried to find a solution at the school, and my colleagues were very concerned to to keep me, and, and they um, did whatever they could to, to make that possible. But at the end of the road, I felt that I, I, I mean, uh, you are getting old, you know, and you can't take up a totally new subject. <laughs> So I stayed on uh, with dogmatics, and, and um, I wanted to continue in dogmatics, but that wasn't possible. Mm. And that meant that I had to leave theology behind for a while. So I have, for the last uh, four or five years, I've mainly been teaching cultural studies, and I've also been slightly involved in, 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 in music studies and these things. So I've done that at uh, different universities. Mm. And I think maybe that wasn't such a bad thing because, um, I mean, there is much to learn. I mean, you can't just dive into this. You have to get accustomed to it and you have to digest, so to speak, the Catholic tradition before you can teach it and you have to live these things. So I felt actually it was sensible in a sense to have some years where I didn't actually teach uh, Catholic theology. I have been concerned to describe myself as a Catholic apprentice. I, I, I want to learn things, and, and uh, I, th- I feel that I learn all the time. Well, it's, it's neat to study culture in a country like this that was, you know, originally pagan and then, and then strongly Catholic mm. for long, many, many, many oh, yes. years, and, yes. then, and then a radical change, and then seeing how that's affected it and seeing the open door. I mean, to see how that's been affected culture is a fascinating study. Yes, it is actually, and... <clears throat> Maybe I should add also in regard to the Norwegian Reformation. Hmm. At that time, Norway was a part of Denmark, you know, and it, all these things were decided by the Danish king. Hmm. I mean, and, but the reality in Norway is that people remained Catholic till well into the 18th century. I mean, they lived a Catholic life hmm. and, 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 and had a Catholic spirituality. So it was only, I mean, they made these decisions in, 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 in Copenhagen or whatever, and they had new mm. bishops, or so called superintendents, that were, of course, committed to the new faith. But people at large, they kind of remained Catholic. What about uh, places like where you were brought up on the West Coast or Bergen or Trondheim? Yeah, especially in remote places, of course, where, where I mean, they couldn't exercise such a strong influence. Mm. But this was the case also in Stavanger. Uh, I mean, there were uh, one of the pastors or priests at the cathedral in Stavanger. He was accused of, of being a crypto-Catholic. So there was a case against him. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so that was, was, was the situation, actually. Did you, uh, how'd your family respond to your journey to the well, Catholic Church? Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad you asked that because I thought this would be difficult and I, I, uh, I have provided my, my parents with many disappointments over the years. So <clears throat> they wanted me to be a missionary, sure. you know, and now he was ending up as a Catholic and, and, <laughs> and, and didn't have a job and whatever. So I thought that this might be difficult, especially to my mother. Mm. But that wasn't the case at all. None of them had any critical remarks to this. And I think they understood that <clears throat> this was a necessity. I mean, it was the only solution. So I was very pleased with that. And I'm pleased to say that my family has been entirely supportive. 
along the whole road. And I think also this reflects a change mm. in regard to the Roman Catholic Church among traditionalist low church Norwegians. I remember when the Pope came in, uh, in um, what was that, in the late uh, 70s. I can't quite remember the year. My father was very concerned and he was listening to radio broadcasts and tried to read what the Pope said and, and everything. And at the end of the road, he had to admit that uh, he was, the things he was saying was actually his faith mm-hmm. that was being formulated. A great witness to us and a great man of God. It definitely yes, and uh, I mean to give you another example. It's just like a couple of weeks ago they had um, <clears throat> a, a, a kind of seminar on on uh, this uh, new book of the Pope uh, on, on on Holy Scripture, this Jesus oh, yes, book, so yes, called. Yes. And then uh, a lot of people came from the seminary of this low church missionary organization, and they spoke very positively on. The book of the Pope. Mm-hmm. So that reflects uh, uh, development. Positive thoughts. Oh, there. definitely, yes. Kings. So things are changing. Oh, well, that's yeah. great. Professor Jerholm, thank I mean, Professor Jerholm, excuse me, thank you so much thank for you sharing your much. journey with us. And uh, we appreciate that and your continued desire to use your gifts for the uh, teaching of theology. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for joining us. Let's take a break and be with you in just a moment. Thanks for staying with us as we visit with special guests from Oslo, Norway. We join now Professor Hans Friedrich Dahl of the University of Oslo, involved for years in political causes far, far removed from the church, despite having a brother who was a professed religious. I welcome you, Professor okay. Dahl. Thank you Thank for you. for joining us and <laughs> inviting us to this country. It's wonderful uh, to be I here. I hope you will feel at home here. Oh, it's wonderful to see that our with our uh, stories that we've been taping over the last couple of days. We've been letting the audience know more about the, the condition of Norway and the, the growth of the Catholic faith here in Norway. It's slow and small, yeah, but it's wonderful. It's moving, yes. It's like a return home of the country back to its yeah. original faith. Mm, yeah. Sadly, and the Catholic Church, when they were established in Norway uh, in the middle of the 19th century, they had came with a with the explicit idea that you should, or Rome should regain Norway as a Catholic country, which of course never, never happened in that sense, but uh, the Catholic faith is, is still growing in a way, and I think it's growing in people's heart and within all the established churches and, and sects of which this country consists. So the idea of the universal church is, I think, on the move forward. Yeah. Even if, even if it's not recognized formally from all parties. <laughs> well, you mentioned the conversion of heart, and, and that's what this program is about. And, and so we're inviting you, if you would, mm. to uh, kind of take a step back, if you would, and let us hear a little bit of your journey of faith, maybe going back. And how were you formed here as a Norwegian? Were you brought up in the Lutheran church? Yes, and uh, I guess my story is uh, <laughs> very typical, typical Scandinavian. Uh, I grew up in a family where my mother was a, a believing Lutheran. Uh, most old people are believing Lutherans in this part of the world, whereas my father, who was an engineer, um, had more lay thoughts and was not uh, affiliated very strongly, at least, to any church. Um, but you know, in Scandinavia, secularism uh, was prevalent after the Second World War. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an upsurge in religious faith and church attendance during the Second World War when the Norwegian church, in some way, acquired the same status as the Polish Catholic Church as a bulwark for national resistance. Mm-hmm. But after the war, when the Germans left and, and, and uh, 
things quieted down. The Norwegian church lost its ground, and uh, most of, especially in the 60s, uh, when I was young, <laughs> secularism was prevalent and is everywhere. So I grew up as a young radical in the Scandinavian welfare state. I did not care about God or anything of the things, things Christians. I looked upon my mother as a well, she was, of course, inspiring as a person, but not religiously. <laughs> but then uh, there occurred in my family this extraordinary thing that my elder brother, who was four years my senior, he converted in the age of 20 to Catholicism, and he didn't stop with that. He stepped right into the, the well of monasty, monasticism as he entered the Catholicism order and became a Carthusian monk in France. I was 18, he was 22. That's got to be rare for Norwegians. Oh, it's more than rare. It was, <laughs> it's, it's never uh, happened. As, yes, which, like, as one Catholic priest actually told my father and mother that you must feel like, you know, your son had entered a Buddhist monastery in Tibet. <laughs> because entering a, a, a Carthusian monastery, nobody had heard about Carthusians, of course, in Norway, but entering a Catholic monastery in France for a young Norwegian in uh, 1960 is very, very rare. <laughs> so this is really was a story. And I hate to tell you that I was initially ashamed of it, because it made our family so extraordinary, and uh, the fact he was my only brother, so special that when people asked, oh, we heard about your brother, I, <laughs> I tended to shy off and would not really talk about it. But then, of course, the Carthusian order, it has its rules, oh, very strict rules, but um, a family, the family of the monks are welcomed two years, two days every year. So my family came to see my brother, then my father, my brother, myself, and my, my wife and my children went to see my brother every year, first in France and then in the United States. So for two days every year, since I was hmm, around 18 years of age, I've been to a Carthusian monastery and <laughs> breathed the spirit and greeted my brother and, of course, stayed close to him for these two days, whereas the other 362 days, three days of the year, I engaged in secular, uh, secular work in my country, Norway. I returned home, uh, entered the uh, publishing industry, then broadcasting, and then finally uh, the University of Oslo as a professor, uh, without having many thoughts about these two days <laughs> per year when I was, so to say, a visiting Catholic. The Did you still consider yourself a Lutheran during those years? No. Yeah, in those years, no, I, I slipped into, into atheism, actually, mm. yeah. Yeah. because I was carried Astray. <laughs> I've carried on the big vibes of radicalism, student radicalism. So, uh, like many other young people in the States and in the Scandinavia, not at least, right. the, 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 so to say, the fires of, of, of political radicalism hmm. was very strong. We were very strong in, in, in the 60s and 70s. So, I, I conducted my political interests within the framework of far-left parties, yes, that is. Yes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I always looked upon my elder brother as some sort of a, a model figure, <laughs> because in my childhood he was the beloved son of my parents. He was extraordinarily gifted, extraordinarily brilliant intellectually, <laughs> extraordinarily <laughs> mature, and so on, whereas I was the small, you know, the little, <laughs> the little boy <laughs> who could be sweet enough, but you not that serious. So I have an innate feeling of, of great reverence for my elder brother. Um, and I've always conducted our correspondence in a serious way. But I never applied his 
his creed, so to say, as relevant for my life. I managed to live the two days <laughs> as a Catholic and the 363 days as a non-Catholic and a non-believer. <laughs> Until I was actually struck by a heart attack and was in serious health troubles myself, it suddenly come, came upon me that probably I should choose my way, as my wife had done three years before. So you see, this is it, the family. But so my story is actually, so to say, uh, uh, a young man, a not so young man, a, a growing um, man, <laughs> old, aging man within the Scandinavian radicalism, secularism, half atheism, being very, very, very much astray from the church and looking upon Catholicism as something from the past, something you perished during the medieval ages and so these past, past ages. But, um, but when confronted with death, myself, thing certain, certainly where it suddenly turned upside down. So, well, mm -hmm. I suddenly felt that my time has come. And so it has. So, I'm here. Well, a couple things then. You're, you said your wife had previously embraced the faith. Yeah. She uh, was very much like my like in, you know, up bring and so on, but she, <laughs> she actually had been a student and was a professional art historian, and she tells me that so many art historians, particularly people who are dealing with the medieval ages and mm -hmm. art in the medieval ages and architecture of the medieval ages, they convert into Catholicism. And this is a pattern both in Sweden, Denmark, and, and Norway, that people engaged in the visual impression of, of course, things religious uh, very strongly, they tend to be more open to religion than, say, people like myself, which, who are historians, sociologists, and <laughs> press people, and, and the like. So she actually, yes, she entered the church four years ago now, and so when I followed suit, it was, of course, in the in the steps, both of my brother and <laughs> my my wife. Now, something else that I had heard uh, this through the sister is that another part of your journey was that you were asked actually to write a book about your brother. I was asked. Was, was that was that an influence on your own journey also? Yes, I uh, I must say yes. Um, I wrote a book about my brother. That was, in fact, a, a sum up, a summing up of my previous, uh, previous, yeah, well, forty-five years as mm -hmm. his brother and as a visiting Catholic, <laughs> um, and I tried to sum up the extraordinary thing which had happened to our family so many years ago, and and I think the book is is uh, is uh, one-sided in the case, in, in the sense that it concentrates or actually narrates more heavily in of the 1950s and 60s than the later ages. Mm -hmm. Of course, a monk's life is dramatic when you enter and so on, when you, and when my brother took on to be a monk and then to fulfill his studies and, you know, being socialized into this, yeah. to me, strange world. That was an extraordinary event, which I dealt with and, and wrote a book about. And, well, when, when finishing that book a couple of years ago, I, was, I felt in a way, well, I've done my duty to, to, to tell the world about him. But I, it didn't occur to me that the story should be uh, of any relevance to myself. <laughs> that occurred first when I was confronted with a crisis, mm -hmm. which I had to look into the, the ultimate, ultimate questions myself. What happened when you were confronted with this uh, the approaching, you're approaching death? Was it a number of illnesses that struck you at the same time? Yeah. Or, yeah. I was unhappy to have, have both a brain 
a brain plug and a, brain, and a heart attack and, and a double-sided pneumonia. Uh, you mentioned it. it took, all at the same time? Yeah, all at the same time. So uh, actually I was, I was deep down. And, um, but, but all the same conscious all through. And uh, well, to describe what really happened is... <laughs> it's difficult, but because <laughs> belief is uh, belief is I've read about it. But what is belief? <laughs> well, belief is you know is the thing you hope for suddenly come they come true <laughs> um, in glimpses and as uh, as a non-realized project as as a light. Yes, it's <laughs> actually. So you you experience the light and then it fades out and you are left in darkness. But still, mm. thinking about it, mm. then the light, the light comes probably on you. At least it's at me, and then and then more darkness. But probably on a high level, mm. I couldn't tell. But after after just I think two uh, forty eight hours, something like that. You know, pondering about this me converting <laughs> me asking a priest for <laughs> taking me into the Catholic Church I had to acquiesce to that thought and I have to, to absorb the light and I had to make this so to say my own mature well <laughs> mature decision um, and uh, it can only be described metaphorically yeah. 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 While you were in the hospital, in your bed. I was very much in hospital, you know, with tubes and and, 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 and equipment, hospital equipment all around me. I was, in fact, on a, an emergency post, so I was very much, <laughs> very much hospitalized. But, um, but I think the spirit was clear, and at least I remember every, every second of these 48 hours mm-hmm. and um, so uh, who came so to see you to help you make that final journey into the faith was it a priest or a oh, s- certainly because first I I had the idea that to <laughs> to acquiesce my wife and my brother I should probably take the sacrament of the sick. The, the former last oil, which is now called the sacrament of the sick. And uh, this was, you know, uh, so to say, to, to as I just towards my, there is my closest persons. Mm-hmm. Uh, without me, I mean, I'm, I'm baptized, so it's yeah. okay. I, I didn't put too much in it, but still it was, you know, a first step. Yeah. So there entered the priest with the uh, paraphernalia and put up, you know, the things. He was not allowed to light the candle, of course, because of the hospital environment. Mm-hmm. But uh, still I was, I was given the sacrament of the sick. Well, that was it. But then entered the thought, oh, why don't you take the ultimate step? Why don't you go one step further and ask for entrance into the church. So that was when these 48 hours started and <laughs> ended up with me asking my wife to arrange for this situation. <laughs> so the priest and more priests and some nuns and my family <laughs> suddenly <laughs> entered the room and put up an altar and made a whole, made a whole procession real for me yes. was that the uh, I don't want to get too personal on the journey but uh, there's certainly an intellectual element of accepting the reality of a faith that you had for so long and I'm guessing that there was a mystical element as you've described this light did that continue in those 48 hours at the end of the 48 hours was there, an, was there a unique essence of conviction in your heart uh, in this journey yeah but uh, there also was, of course, after after the thing had happened, I felt I was filled with joy, and I expected in a way that I should be filled with joy. This yeah. should be important, and it was important. 
still I was a very sick person. So physically um, I was uh, almost shipwrecked, but uh, still with a, a more intense hope of overcoming and certainly joining the world. I had a, had this intense feeling that I had to come on, come on my own feet to see the world and show the world I'm alive. Uh, when when I even even could claim to be a Christian, a Catholic, uh, in that situation, I that inspired me all the more to, to get on my feet and. and try to show myself off to the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, here you are today. I, so what happened? Well, what happened? Well, I very quickly, I, I, I overcome my uh, very serious uh, sickness. And um, the Sisters of London and our all good friends had prayed for me. And um, I, even nowadays, I meet people who tell me that, oh, you look great. You came through it. You did. Yeah, I, I, I prayed for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, of course, prayer has had something to do with this. Uh, I'm a, a, fresh, a fresh Christian, a fresh Catholic. I do not understand so much, but, <laughs> but I have some, some ideas of how things work, and this worked with me. Uh, some sort of my sense is that some sort of a miracle has happened, so mm -hmm. I'm grateful for this. And probably the most overwhelming, the most overwhelming feeling I had when 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 it was clear that I was through the tunnel and, and actually I was going to be well again. And the doctor said, "You will be well again." Well, <laughs> it was a intense feeling of, of thankfulness. So I stretched my arm up in the, in the middle of the night and just thanked God for, for life, for all that all these people had done for me, for the priests, for the nuns, for their prayers, and a little bit for myself perhaps, but mostly for my family. They had they had carried me through this, and mm -hmm. and they had done this as part of their creed and their dedication as Christians. Not only the doctors, you know, and all this technology which surrounds you, but a spiritual part of, of the healing story, which was of immense importance to me and really Filled it, so filled my my body and soul with with gratitude. So that's my my so to say my plus income. So to say my gainings from this is that I now know what thankfulness and gratitude is. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you may say you know what God is. Yeah. I had some ideas before, and certainly he has fulfilled something. But personally, the, the, the ability to feel and into the inmost fiber of my body and the inmost corner of my soul, to feel what is gratitude, how you can really be, felt, to be filled up with the feeling of, of, of gratitude and thankfulness. That's my story. And that is a gift of grace. It's the only place we can put it, right? It was a gift of God. Is your brother still alive? The he is. Have you talked to him? Have you met with him in those two days? Have you had those two <laughs> days since your conversion? I had to be careful about taking and uh, going, entering an airplane and, uh -huh. and going to the st so far as the States. Mm -hmm. The first year I was healed. But now, this summer I'm going. Actually, in, in, in the beginning of July, uh, my wife and I and our dear friend, Sister Annelise of London Castro, mm -hmm. with all three of us embark on an airplane. That's a dangerous thing <laughs> for a man with a heart attack. And we will go to the States and visit my brother. And that will be my first personal encounter with him. But of course, we have written letters. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the expression of that gratitude that uh, mm -hmm. I'm great joy about when he knows about his little brother experiencing the same joy of the faith. Mm -hmm. You mentioned prayer. 
in what ways, maybe to the audience, there are people out there that are probably our age that have still struggled with the faith, and you mentioned prayer. How do you see the importance of prayer in your continued journey? Very important, of course. Um, but it is with prayer as with other things that it sometimes works and sometimes it doesn't seem to work that well. So it it fills you with the obligation you should you should give it a try. And uh, I, as as most most Catholic ideas, I make a try every night. And sometimes I'm rewarded by really a blessing and sometimes it's more like a, you know, a meditation. Right. But it is always useful, at least as a meditation. And even if the meditation is, well, it doesn't always work. <laughs> I mean, and why? And how should my thoughts be, be successful in meeting him? Uh, and not be distracted by other things. So um, even, even if it doesn't work, it is useful, I think. Hmm. So prayer is important as a routinelessly, daily thing, a, a thing of duty. Yes, and obedience. And obedience. To me, your, your expression of there in the middle of the night after all that would happen and raising your hands to God, I mean, that's... Prayer. I mean, that's the prayer of gratitude yeah. for all that he had done mm. in an unexpected way to you that you never had ever dreamed of before mm. or anticipated what we were able to experience. Yeah. Professor Dahl, thank you so much no for sharing your journey and inspiring us to be even more open to how God really wants to tell. Well, our need to be grateful and gratitude for all that we take for granted in our life. Thank you very much for your witness. Okay. And thank you for sharing the, also the journey of faith of Norway and the need for that continued conversion in all of our lives. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on this special edition of The Journey Home. God bless you. See you again, sir.